Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to our first Delaware State Assessment and Improvement Plan Coalition meeting. We are so grateful that you joined us today and really excited about the discussions we're going to have and the opportunities for us to discuss the state of health in Delaware. My name is Yandalela Kaffi, and I'm an assistant professor in the epidemiology program here at the University of Delaware. And I also have the pleasure of being the associate director of the Partnership for Healthy Communities. The Delaware SHIP is a partnership between the Division of Public Health, the University of Delaware Epidemiology Program, and the University of Delaware Partnership for Healthy Communities. And it's our hope today that this meeting will be informative to you as we discuss the objectives of the SHIP, of the SHIP but also the state health assessment. We'll describe the vital conditions and we'll spend some time actually talking about the vital conditions and getting your feedback and thoughts about them as well. We're really looking forward to your feedback and um, engagement with the Delaware SHIP. Thank you. So first, before we start, I'd like to just start out by talking about our agenda for today. So first, I wanna introduce you to our amazing team. And that's uh, the individuals who uh, are a part of the epidemiology program, as well as the Partnership for Healthy Communities. And then we'll move into an introduction where we'll actually talk about the statewide health improvement process, or our SHIP, and that'll be done by Noel um, Duckworth. Then we'll talk about collaboration and the importance of collaboration. And then we'll launch into our introduction of the vital conditions. We'll take a brief break and we'll come back and we'll actually do a world cafe, which is a really fun approach for fostering discussions. And we'll continue that discussion about the vital conditions. We'll move into our mission and vision. This is an important element of what we're doing. And we really wanna get your feedback and thoughts about our mission and vision as well so that we can incorporate that into it. And then we'll close by just talking about the next steps, what the future looks like for us, and then we'll adjourn for the day. So welcome again to the Delaware SHIP. And the reason that we wanted to share this slide with you is because it really encapsulates and captures all of the different elements of health. It captures, if you look in there, some of the vital conditions that we're gonna be talking about, but it also highlights those really important words that are the underpinnings of everything that we're doing with the Delaware SHIP, focusing on health, focusing on community, but also focusing on equity, which is a driving force in everything that we do. Next slide, please. So first, meet our team. So we have our individuals from the program in epidemiology. We are led by Dr. Jennifer Horney. She's a, a principal investigator, but she's also a professor of epidemiology here at the University of Delaware. I also wanna introduce our project director. This is Dr. Leanne Fox. And then we have two members of our team who you may not see today, um, Matt Simmons, um, who is our spatial data consultant, and then Maria Pellicone, who is our business administrator. And now I'd like to introduce you to the Partnership for Healthy Communities team. I'm a part of the, of the Partnership for Healthy Communities and I already introduced myself, but I'd like to introduce you to Noelle Duckworth. She's gonna be introducing us to the state health improvement process. So you'll hear from her a little bit later. Within the Partnership for Healthy Community, we have a number of community engaged initiatives um, that fall under the umbrella of the Partnership for Healthy Communities. And one of those is the Healthy Communities Delaware Initiative. And that's led by Kate DuPont Phillips, also a member of our team. And last but not least, Paulette Hussey Kasten, who is a part of our administrative support team, but is integral and in actually engaging with our SHIP website. And if you haven't had an opportunity to look at our website, I invite you to do so. It's it's phenomenal. Let's move to the next slide, please. Also, the Delaware SHIP would not be what it is without the support of our students here at the University of Delaware. And we are thankful to have wonderful students who are supporting this project. I'd like to introduce Danielle White, Danielle White, Alexander Burris, one of our MPH students here, and another MPH student, but also one of our graduate research assistants, Braulio Florentino Benitez. Okay. And so one of the things that we wanted to share with you are what are the benefits of engagement? And for us at the University of Delaware and the Partnership for Healthy Community, community engagement is embedded and threaded throughout what we do. And there are a couple different elements to the way that we view the, continue, the community engagement continuum. There's three the four elements. The first is to inform. The second is to consult. The third is to involve. And the fourth, fourth is to collaborate. So when we're thinking about informing, first, we provide the community with balanced information to understand the problems or the challenges that are taking place in our communities. 
The second part of that is we consult. So we actually work and obtain feedback from our community members. And that feedback is vital to us because it actually helps us with the process of analyzing and understanding the data, but it also informs decision-making and helps us think a little bit more about the future and what's next for us. The third part is we involve. So community gives non-binding but influential advice to us. And so we wanna have that level of involvement with the community where we actually get your advice and start to think about how we can embed that in what we're doing. And last but not least, but definitely one of the most important is collaborating. And we wanna ensure that we are enabling the community to participate in every aspect of the planning and decision-making process. And that's one of the reasons that we're here today is to collaborate, to get your feedback, your experiences, share with us your thoughts about what we're doing and to help inform the Delaware ship. Thank you, Yanda. So next we're gonna discuss our objectives. So the state health assessment and improvement plan process is intended to be collaboratively developed to increase alignment and investment in the implementation of the work to improve health, well-being, and equity for all people in Delaware. Our first objective is to identify needs and priority populations. We also aim to participate in providing meaningful input, find inspiration and practical tools, and lastly, embrace and acknowledge the wisdom and learning capacities of all participants. Hi everyone, this is Noelle Duckworth with the Partnership for Healthy Communities and thank you, Danielle. Um, before I begin an overview of the state health improvement process, we just wanted to take a short poll um, to um, give a chance for all of you to share more about what your level of engagement has been to date uh, with Delaware SHIP. So you should see the poll on your screen. If you can just take a minute or two to read through those options and And if some of my co-hosts have the ability to share that, because it's not letting me do it, yay technology. But I see that people are clicking away, so thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so I will tell you that it looks like overwhelmingly, um, we have, um, uh, not overwhelmingly, but we have about half of you all who are new. You have just entered the gangway to the big cruise ship um, and you're about to board. So this is your first introduction. Uh, but we also have a nice mix of seasoned shipmates um, who've helped us chart the course, helped uh, public health chart the course over the years, uh, and maybe a few others who uh, have been on the ship but might not have had a chance to disembark and um, explore every port <laughs> or been able to uh, really stay on for the whole voyage. So it's really great to see this nice mix that we have. Um, a lot of newcomers um, and then seasoned shipmates, as I said. And as you can see, I am that team member who gets swept up in the nautical metaphor, so forget it. Okay, so the overview of the state health improvement process, um, it really is a two-part process, uh, includes both a statewide health assessment, which we call SHA, SHA, and a state health improvement plan, um, SHIP. And the SHA um, is really the foundation to inform the state plan that we um, hope to write uh, with all of you. It's a, um, as, as, as we, you'll continue to hear throughout the presentation today, um, it's a collaborative process involving the community, stakeholders, and partners. Um, we've already started some primary data collection and analysis, and Braulio uh, will share more with you about both quantitative data that's been underway, um, new data we're collecting in communities across Delaware, um, as well as qualitative data that we have planned um, in 2023. And then secondary data gathering, um, all of the existing surveillance data, um, other reports um, and, and input from your organizations, public health data, uh, vital stats, you name it, um, gathering that to get a better understanding of, um, of, of what the data says. And the environmental scan is you know, really important because it aims to ensure that information uh, from one group or an individual um, that they might have is really shared across the whole coalition. Um, and because this is important information, um, and this breadth of information will in help inform our collective strategic thinking, um, make sure it's a diverse, make sure it avoids being narrowly focused on what um, a select few may think are important or have knowledge of. And also sometimes can be the case 
um, avoids becoming narrowly focused just on what those holding more influence or power might think are most important. So it's really critical to make sure we have access to this data and have a good understanding of what's happening um, in our state. Of course, we don't have infinite resources or time, so that's why it's important to start sharing now. Um, our timeline is to complete a comprehensive state health assessment by the end of June 2023. Um, at which point we'll then use that, um, we hope, to really inform writing and developing a new plan. Again, the planning part, part writing goals and objectives, uh, really will be a collaborative process as well, we hope, um, in inviting all of you to continue to work with us on that. Um, it involves multi-sector government agencies, um, nonprofits, grassroots collectives, faith-based groups, coalitions, businesses, and so forth. Um, and we obviously wish to ensure that the plan includes goals and objectives that the Division of Public Health can specifically act on. But we hope that the plan is useful to all groups and sectors involved in this process in terms of identifying ways in which we can all take meaningful action and move in the same direction together. Um, it sets priorities for a system-wide response to the public health needs of Delaware. Again, it's not just a plan for uh, health, the health department. Or, or specific agency, but it's for all of us. And it describes, again, how we're gonna to work together to achieve optimal health for all Delawareans, hopefully no exceptions. And we must and will, of course, rely upon effective and sustained partnerships. Um, it informs DPH's um, str uh, strategic plan as well, uh, and that they'll be writing and are writing. And it's an important note here that's related, I think, that um, certainly speaks to, to my interest in being involved in this important project. The state health assessment, the health improvement plan and, and a public health's own strategic plan are requirements for um, health departments to get accredited. And um, they go through that process every five years. In fact, kudos to our developer division of public health for their recent reaccreditation this past summer. Um, huge feat to have to be going through that, um, you know, in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, so, uh, but it's important for all of us to understand that our engagement and support in this process really helps ensure a strong public health infrastructure for our state, which I know we all um, want to continue to build and, and have. Uh, the timeline is that the current SHIP plan, uh, which you can download on the Delaware SHIP website, we put in the chat, um, ends in 2023. And so the new five-year plan will span the year 2023 through 2028. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Braulio, who's gonna share more about the new assessments underway and how um, all of you can get involved with either those efforts or by sharing other existing data you think are critical to include in the state health assessment. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Noel. So for the primary data collection, we have been doing CASPERS. CASPERS stand for Community Assessments for Public Health Emergency Response. Um, we have completed CASPERS both in Newcastle and Kent so far, um, completing over 350 surveys and well over 600 hours of volunteer time from both community members and student surveyors. Uh, we have a third CASPER scheduled for February 2023 in Sussex County. We will also be hosting three community conversations to be held from February to March 2023. We'll be, we will be hosting one in every county, um, and that will be our qualitative data collection. Um, if you are interested in participating with uh, with us on data collection, have any recommendations for our secondary data collection and analysis, or uh, groups, or have any recommendations for groups um, that you think should be sitting at this table, please let us know at info at um, Next, please. Um, thank you, Noelle. Uh, so a huge thank you to all of the organizations that have supported us and uh, worked with us through um, these last two Caspers and through everything, we definitely couldn't have gotten as much done as we have without their support. Uh, so thank you to all of the organizations. They span from community-based organizations to local businesses. To uh, so thank you to uh, for to everyone. Thank you, Braulio. Welcome, everyone. I just wanted to touch on collaboration. So we strongly believe that successful community engagement and collaboration strengthens our ability to gather key information about the daily lives of Delawareans. We are committed to improving community health and well-being and cannot do it without you. So thank you for joining us. Next, I'll pass it to Kate and Alex to introduce the vital conditions. Thanks, Leanne. I'm Kate DuPont Phillips, Executive Director of Healthy Communities Delaware. And 
I'm passionate about the vital conditions, so it's exciting for me to get to share with you this framework that we are using for the state health assessment in this go round. Many of you are probably familiar with this concept, upstream versus downstream, when we think about health, or the idea of prevention and root cause versus treatment. So these are not meant to be mutually exclusive. Obviously, caring for individuals and treating disease is of critical importance, and a few of you on the call are related to the healthcare sector, and thank you for all of the incredible work that you do. Um, many times in the past, state health assessments have focused on disease states, specific health indicators, and we are learning more in the health system and in public health that we should really take the opportunity to think more about the upstream factors that influence a lot of different health conditions. If we think about individuals and their individual health needs, you can see on the bottom right corner, we tend to think about hospitals and specialists. And that is a really resource intensive um, time and money, resource intensive way to approach health. So the state health assessment this go round is taking the opportunity to think more upstream. And what does that mean? It means we're gonna think about the conditions in communities and our environments that help to promote health and well being, specifically helping people be well and live healthy lives and hopefully to have fewer of them become ill and have to use hospital and specialists. This is a long-term proposition. So this is one opportunity that we're taking to sort of move a bit in that direction. That said, the state health assessment will include um, data on both upstream factors as well as specific health indicators. So as, you, as we think about these upstream factors, what are they? They're in things like environment, housing, nutrition, education, and income. Many of you may be familiar with the story that we often use in public health to kind of explain this upstream versus downstream scenario. So I'll share that story briefly. Imagine a large river with a high waterfall. At the bottom of this waterfall, hundreds of people are working frantically trying to save those who have fallen into the river and have fallen down the waterfall, many of them drowning. As the people along the shore are trying to rescue as many as possible, one individual looks up and sees a seemingly never ending stream of people falling down the waterfall and begins to run upstream. One of the other rescuers hollers, where are you going? There are so many people that need help here. To which the man replied, I'm going upstream to find out why so many people are falling into the river. So as you look further upstream, you notice bridges in various states of repair along the river. Some are strong, made of sturdy components. Others are weak and debilitated with missing boards or flimsy railings. It doesn't surprise you that most of the people falling in the river are crossing the poorly made bridges, and those individuals that live near or travel across the strong bridges are protected. Of course, all the bridges could use more reinforcement, but it's easy to see which bridges need the most attention. In the stream parable, we know that certain groups of people are more likely to fall in the river than others. This is an equity issue. They don't fall in because of individual weakness, or intrinsic flaws. Rather, they just don't have the privilege that many of us have to live in communities with strong bridges. So that's one of the reasons we're really focusing on equity also in this state health assessment to try to create environments for all that address these upstream factors. So that's another reason that we're using this vital conditions for health and well-being framework as the framework for the state health assessment. It addresses these upstream factors, the environments that enable us to be healthy and well. So if we think about these factors, what, what is it that makes up a healthy, safe, and vibrant community where there's opportunity for all people? We call these the vital conditions, which are very similar to social determinants of health. Many of you are familiar with that. What are the things that all people need all the time to thrive and reach our full potential? And those are the things you'll see on the graphic, the vital conditions framework graphic on the right. A thriving natural world, basic needs for health and safety, humane housing, meaningful work and wealth, lifelong learning, reliable transportation, and belonging and civic muscle. Belonging and civic muscle is at the center because it really influences progress in all of the other vital conditions. Another reason we chose um, the vital conditions framework for the state health assessment is because the federal government is moving in the direction of using the vital conditions framework. Just a few weeks ago, the federal plan 
for equitable long-term recovery and resilience was released. And this is exciting for a few different reasons. It's an interagency plan. We know that the federal government is often siloed, but more than 30 agencies have collaborated over the last few years on developing this plan. It is intended to guide long-term investment from the federal government. It uses the vital conditions as its organizing principle. So we really have an opportunity in Delaware to align with this framework that's being used nationally, that's being moved towards nationally. And the idea of the plan is that it's going to provide an actionable path for this whole of government collaborative approach, specifically to improve the vital conditions. Now, the government recognizes that this is going to take a transformational systemic change. You know, there's a lot of siloing and they're going to have to work together across uh, departments and agencies, specifically around the vital conditions framework and how they can collaborate and work together. Another element of this plan that's exciting is that it really focuses on community-centered collaboration, understanding better what communities themselves believe and know that they need to improve related to the vital conditions. And this idea is also supposed to maximize, so let's look at the money we already have, the steady, steady state investments and other federal investments, how can we use them in a more combined and collaborative manner? And the entire plan, which is exciting, is focused around equity and specifically aims to eliminate disparities. So those are the reasons we're using the vital conditions framework. And so we're going to talk to you a little bit more about descriptions of each of these vital conditions so you can get to understand each of them a little bit better. We're also going to share some secondary data, a few indicators for each of the vital conditions. Now, I should say that there are many, many indicators that could be used here. We are just choosing a few. Um, and we're happy to hear from you whether you feel that there are others that we should consider including in the state health assessment. The indicators that we show you will be in a chart. Um, there are some, the blue indicators indicate where we're doing fairly well in terms of Delaware compared to the national average. And in orange shows where there are areas of opportunity for improvement. And we've also noted the Healthy People 2030 leading health indicators on the uh, slides that you'll see in a few minutes. So Healthy People 2030 is the federal government's framework um, of objectives that they believe what we want to focus on to improve health over the next 10 years. So I'm going to turn it over to Alex Burris now to um, take us through the first few vital conditions. Thank you, Kate. Uh, good morning, everybody. Once again, my name is Alexander Burris, and I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit more about some of the vital conditions and give a little bit of additional info about where Delaware stands quantitatively compared to national averages. So the first of the seven vital conditions is basic needs for health and safety. So in order to satisfy some of these needs, there are a few basic requirements that need to be met. So having access to nutritious food, safe drinking water, fresh air, sufficient sleep, uh, being able to engage in routine physical activity, access to safe and satisfying sexuality and reproduction, as well as freedom from trauma, violence, addiction, and crime, and routine physical and mental health. So let's take a, a look at some of the numbers on the next slide. So as we can see, Delaware has excelled in some areas, but in other areas, there are opportunities for improvement compared to national metrics. Like for example, life expectancy at birth. There's a small difference between us and that of the national uh, average, as well as more Delawareans living in areas with low food access. And this is um, where more than one half mile in an urban setting or more than 10 miles uh, in rural areas of travel is required to get to the nearest supermarket, super center, or a large grocery store. Uh, many Delawareans also suffer from a lack of primary health care professionals near their homes, um, increasing drug over overdose deaths, homicide rates, cigarette smoking among adults, um, as well as uh, adults who need to meet the uh, minimum guidelines, current minimum guidelines for physical aerobic physical activity and muscle strengthening uh, activity. So these are just a couple areas that remain a concern uh, as we discuss needs for basic, basic health and safety. So next slide. So next I'd like to discuss a little bit about reliable transportation. So this framework includes things like safe transport, active transport, which includes travel via public transportation, like bicycling, walking, uh, taking the bus, things of that nature, um, efficient energy use, as well as few environmental hazards. So on the next slide, we can see uh, the Delaware, um, the average commute time for Delawareans is in line of that of the national average. So about 23 minutes, 20, 26.3 minutes um, is the average commute time 
However, motor vehicle crash deaths and active commuting represent opportunities for improvement. So more people could have access or more people could um, take public transportation or walk or be able to bicycle to their place of work or wherever they need to go as compared to that of the national average. And also motor vehicle crash deaths are a little bit above the national uh, data. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, the third vital condition is lifelong learning, and this is defined by continuous learning, uh, education, and literacy. So opportunities uh, could include things like early childhood experiences, uh, the continuous development of cognitive, social, emotional abilities, um, elementary, high school, and higher education, as well as career and adult education. So on the next slide, we can see that Delaware does a relatively good job in terms of providing opportunities to uh, people for lifelong learning. So for example, preschool enrollment, uh, adults with at least some college reading proficiency and adults with a high school diploma are uh, providing metrics on a statewide level above that of the national data. But there are a couple areas that are needed for in terms of like improvement. Um, on time high school graduation is lower than that of the national average as well as fourth grade students whose reading levels are at or above the proficient uh, achievement level, level for their grade is below national average. So these represent just a couple opportunities that we have for improvement. So next slide. Now the fourth vital condition is meaningful work and wealth. This would include things such as rewarding well, rewarding work, uh, careers, as well as higher standards of living. So a couple of things this would include or encapsulate would be things like job training and retraining, good paying and fulfilling jobs, family and community wealth, as well as savings and limited debt. And so, as we can see on the next slide, with the metrics that, that we've seen or that we've chosen to display here, Delaware does a relatively good job compared to that of national metrics in terms of things like median household income, home ownership, high paying jobs, as well as poverty being below 100% of the federal poverty level. So good news in that respect. So I'd like to pass it back to Kate and she's gonna discuss the rest of the uh, vital conditions framework for you guys. Thanks, Alex. So turning to a few more of the vital conditions, if we think about a thriving natural world, the world around us, what does that mean? It means sustainable resources, contact with nature for everyone, and freedom from hazards. So we're thinking about clearing air, water, and soil, healthy and sustainable ecosystems, again, accessible natural spaces for everyone, even within cities, and freedom from extreme heat, wind, earthquakes, pathogens, flooding, et cetera. So a few of the indicators for a thriving natural world that we see, we're doing pretty close to the national average on particulate matter, um, level in the air, proximity to highways, a few um, opportunities for improvement relate to extreme heat and flood vulnerability. So extreme heat, when we're looking at that indicator, that's the percentage of days per year for which the daily maximum temperature is at or above the 90th percentile. And extreme heat often happens in urban areas where there's little tree canopy. So in Wilmington, that's an example of an area where we would have an extreme heat challenge. Flood vulnerability is another area of opportunity. We're slightly above the national average. We know that Delaware is a low lying state. So we do have some challenges with flooding in a variety of parts of the state. So the flood vulnerability percentage is about 7.95, and that's the percentage of housing units that are within the FEMA designated flood hazard zone. And um, there, we know that related to flood vulnerability, often low income communities have fewer resources to mitigate flood flooding than communities with more resources. So I'll go next to humane housing. If we think about housing, we're talking about humane, consistent, safe, healthy, affordable housing. That means adequate space per person, safe structures, affordability. This is a great one, diverse neighborhoods without gentrification, segregation, and concentrated poverty. And of course, we want our humane housing to be close to the places we work, go to school, buy food, have recreation, and nature. So if we look at humane housing, a few of the indicators are pretty much in line with the national average um, in terms of incomplete plumbing, overcrowded households, and vacant housing. Where we have a few opportunities for improvement are in high housing costs and multifamily housing. So related to high housing costs, we are slightly below the national average, which is good. However, nearly a third of Delawareans are experiencing challenges with high housing costs. So that's a huge population. And one of the reasons we would be concerned about this specific indicator because it's impacting a lot of people. 
Multifamily housing is specifically the percentage of housing structures with two or more housing units per structure. And so in this case, we want this percentage to be higher and the national average is higher. And the reason that is, um, is affordable housing is often multifamily housing. If you think about condos or apartments and Delaware is significantly and severely lacking in multifamily housing and affordable housing. So we'd love to see um, that improve. Belonging and civic muscle is the last uh, vital condition and one of the most important ones because it really influences the rest of the vital conditions. So it's talking about a sense of belonging and the power to shape a common world. So that includes everything from social support and civic associations, freedom from stigma, discrimination, and oppression, collective efficacy of vibrant arts and culture and spiritual life, and lots of opportunities for public engagement. Um, so let's look at a couple of the indicators for belonging and civic muscle. So many of these still in line with the national average um, in terms of youth not in school and not working, inadequate social and emotional support, slightly below the national average, computer and internet access for doing a little bit better than the nation, and then just some opportunities for improvement. Obviously, voting participation, we're about in line with the national average, but we'd obviously love to see everyone vote. Um, so about only two thirds of those eligible to vote in Delaware cast a ballot in the last presidential election. And in terms of isolated seniors, again, right around the national average, but um, isolated seniors represents a person over 65 in their own household alone. So isolation is obviously a challenge for mental health and well-being. Um, so those are just a few of the many, many indicators um, that relates to a variety of these vital conditions. So we hope we've given you a bit of a taste and an overview of what some of the vital condition status looks like in Delaware for our state. Again, we're really excited to be using this framework. And I noticed as many of you are on the call that many of you are experiencing the state health assessment for the first time. And part of that is because we're just starting to use this vital conditions framework. And we're really excited to have all of you at the table that are help us represent not just health and healthcare, but also the various elements of the vital conditions. So thank you again for joining us. So what we're going to do now is just transition into a quick five minute break. And so if I look at my watch, it's 1135, we're going to go to 1140. So we'll give you a quick five minute break and then come back and do some activities. And we're hoping you'll share some information with us. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much. So before, um, so what we're going to be doing next is we're transitioning into a world cafe. What a world cafe is, is it's a conversational tool that fosters knowledge sharing within groups. So before the break, Kate and Braulio did a wonderful overview of the vital conditions. And now we wanna continue in that same lane by breaking into groups and having a more in-depth discussion about the vital conditions. So what we did is initially when you registered for this, you all expressed an interest in certain vital conditions. And we took the top three that you all mentioned you were interested in, and we determined that those would be the ones that we would discuss today. So those vital conditions are belonging and civic muscle, basic needs for health and safety, and humane housing. But before we break into our sessions, let me walk you through the process of what a World Cafe looks like. So first, we'll set the context and the guidelines, and I'll do that in just a moment. Each round is gonna be guided by a question. So when you get into your breakout groups, there'll be two to three questions that we'll discuss related to the vital condition. In our small groups, we'll have a round of conversation. So you'll first discuss one vital condition, then you'll move, then you'll be in another group where you'll discuss, you'll stay in the same group, but you'll discuss another vital condition and you'll have an opportunity to talk about all three of those vital conditions today. At the end of each round, participants would typically move, but because we're doing this on Zoom, instead the facilitators are going to move and you'll stay in your group. And then when the facilitators join the new group, what we'll do is we'll share what was discussed in our previous group with you, and then we can continue to pick up on that discussion and get your feedbacks and thoughts on those topics as well. It sounds like a good time, so I hope you all enjoy it. Now, let's talk about some of the guidelines for a World Cafe. The main things are to just focus on what matters. So we have questions and topics that we're going to discuss and just to continue focusing on those topics and sharing your thoughts. We want you to listen, to understand. 
We want you to comment and share your ideas, but also to contribute your own thinking and also bring in your own experiences and work and, and living as a Delaware resident. And then as we work together to have this conversation, let's listen together and see if we can find patterns and find deeper meaning in some of the discussions that we're having. We really hope that you all will enjoy this. And now we're gonna break you out into your World Cafe groups and the facilitators, we'll see you in there. Let's advance the slide. Just thinking about all those great conversations we had and um, the different themes that we touched on, we'd like you to now help us form our mission and vision statements for the statewide health improvement plan. So we have an example mission statement or a jumping off place. So to make the state of Delaware a healthier and more equitable place to live, work, learn, and play. Um, our example vision statements are all people in Minnesota enjoy healthy lives and healthy communities. And Ohio is a model of health, well-being, and economic vitality. So um, I'm going to put a link in the chat here, and we ask that you join us on a jam board. Just thinking about these things. Um, so please click on the link. And then once um, you've clicked on the link, there's a series of sticky notes. Just double click the sticky notes and please, you can add words or terms that help us with our core purpose, our focus or aims. Um, or if you'd like to try writing a vision statement, feel free to do that as well. Kate, can you please click on the Jamboard so everyone can see it? Thank you. So you'll see on our screen what the Jamboard looks like, but you'll actually have to click on the link in the chat to go to the Jamboard itself and enter your thoughts. So we're doing both mission and vision statements. Yes. Mm -hmm. not, not one to cover both. Uh, no, we, we, we plan to have a mission and vision statement. If anyone is struggling with um, the vision board, you can drop it in the chat and we'll add it for you. Yeah, so it looks like um, we're getting some good things. Uh, equitable health and equitable access. Delaware is first in health. It's a great statement. 
um, to make the state of Delaware a more friendly and exciting place to live for everyone, to protect, promote, and improve the health of people in Delaware through integrated state, county, and community efforts from Florida's mission statement. Um, enable every Delawarean to live a healthy life. Somebody likes the actual example of the mission statement a lot. Um, Delaware having rent control policies for consumers. All people and places in Delaware are thriving, no exceptions. To improve the health and well being and outcomes of all individuals calling Delaware home. Quality life and access to basic needs. I think we need to go back a page. There we go. Uh, mission to promote and improve the health of people in Delaware through integrated state, county, and community efforts. Oh, I read that one. Um, so we will try to put these together and um, include them in our next iteration of the mission and vision statement present that at our next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for engaging in rich discussions about the vital conditions and helping us as we refine and define what our mission and vision um, statements will look like. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is the first of our coalition meetings, it's the first of four, um, and we are planning to have our meetings every other month uh, where we'll meet the first Thursday of the month. And we hope that you will join us at our next meeting, which will be held February 10th, a Thursday, 2023. Again, same time, 11 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. And it'll be held virtually on Zoom. So we look forward to catching up with you all again, continuing our discussions, and also coming back and sharing with you our feedback and our and um, the findings from today. Thank you so much for your engagement. And again, for being a part of our day. We really appreciate it.